talking about how to create our own custom event listeners in GTM. Now, why should you do that in the first place? Well, GTM only offers you natively a handful of event listeners. I mean, don't take me wrong, they're really useful. But what about if you want to listen to very intricate form interactions, for example? What about if you want to track mouse movement with a really detailed... Well, in this class, we'll be talking about how we can build those custom event listeners. We'll also talk about how you can build a generic event message that is always passed with these listeners so that it will be extremely easy to set up new interaction listeners in your container. Now, unfortunately, custom templates doesn't yet support event listening, so we'll be creating these the old-fashioned style of custom HTML tags. So if you're ready, let's take a closer look at how to build our own custom event listeners in Google Tag Manager. In this lesson, we'll create our own custom event listener. So picking up what we learned from the previous lesson, we'll be using the browser's own APIs to build some event handling capabilities directly into GTM. And we'll be using events that GTM doesn't record by default. So just check the objectives out. Um, in this lesson, we'll learn how event handling works in JavaScript because that's what we'll be essentially doing. We'll be building JavaScript event handlers. We'll understand the different types of browser events that exist before taking a group of these browser events specifically related to form tracking, and we'll use those to learn how to build our own event listeners in GTM using the custom HTML tag. So just to take a look where we are on this course, we're now in lesson number three, which is the, the, the second and last part of the first thematic event group called event tracking. and. Um, after this lesson, we'll jump into a different thematic group. So the, this concludes our little foray into how GTM handles browser event tracking natively. So without further ado, let's take a look at how custom event listeners in Google Tag Manager work and how we can use them to, to really enhance the capabilities of GTM as an interaction tracking system. GTM is a JavaScript library, so it leverages the same browser APIs that any other JavaScript library would. And JavaScript offers you a couple of ways in which to attach listeners to the page or to the individual elements on the page. And these listeners will listen for, literally listen for interactions with the mouse or the keyboard, and will then signal the browser that, hey, something happened. And you can use the signal as a callback to let GTM know by a data layer push that, that um, um, the user has now made an interaction on the page. So this is a this is a little screenshot of an a tip, very typical HTML structure with nested elements. There's an article element on the very top level, which then has embedded div and header elements, and then there are a couple of links there as well, the anchor elements or the a tags that you can see. Uh, which are the ones in this example that we actually want to track. So to attach a listener, there are two prime ways to do it. The first one is to attach it directly to the element. So you're telling the browser, hey, I want to listen for some interaction with this particular element. So the way it works is that first you need to fetch a, a, a reference to that exact element. So in this example, we're using document query selector API, which, which takes a CSS selector as an argument uh, in this case, we're looking for uh, an anchor element with the class link unstyled. That is the direct child of a header element with the class post short and title. So we can make a reasonable ex ex expectation or assumption that with this CSS selector, we'll only pick up one single element on the page. And query selector always returns the first element in any, in any case. So it only returns a single element. So we're, we're restoring this in the L local variable. And in the next line, we're using the add event listener uh, method of the HTML element. So we're telling the browser that, hey, add an event listener to the L element, which is the, the anchor element that's, that's circled in red. The first argument is what type of event you want to listen to. In this case, we want to listen to a mouse click event. So the click event is, is fired when the mouse left button, right button, or the mouse wheel is clicked um, on the element itself. Uh, so we're telling that the element name is click. And there are other elements you can listen to as well, and we'll get to those shortly. Then we're telling that when the element is clicked, this is the name of the method that should be called um, to let the, the browser GTM know that something happened. So callback is a method that I haven't defined in this example yet, but callback is the name of the method that will execute once the click happens. 
And the last parameter basically tells the browser to use the capture phase. So in the previous lesson, we talked about capturing and bubbling. And in this case, we'll always use capture equals true because uh, using the capture phase is just a, just a solid way to, to handle events. And there's very little reason to ever have that false or, or not have that third argument in that add event listener call. And for when you attach the um, the um, listener to the element itself, when the callback is called, you always know that the element that was clicked was the particular element in question because you only attach that events listener to that one element. So whenever the callback is called, you don't have to check what was the element that was clicked. You can just hard code all the values as in this example. So the callback is a function that has a single window data layer push with a custom event name, in this case, custom click, and then a data layer variable called element, element text. And you could pull in the, the text content of the element dynamically, but because it's the single element that we know that was clicked, we can just hard code the, the element text directly into the push. So this is how event handling basically works. You need a reference to an element, then you call the add event listener method for that element. You tell which element you want to listen, what method to call when that when that um, event happens, and whether to use the capture or the bubble phase. Then the other way to do it, and this is actually how GTM works as well, is to use event delegation, which we also talked about in the previous lesson. So instead of adding the listener directly to the element, we'll add the listener to an element higher up in the DOM tree and just have the event climb up or bubble up all the way to the um, to the higher element. And this has some, some benefits compared to adding it directly to an element. First of all, you only need a single listener. You don't need to add two listeners to one for each anchor element in the, in the screenshot, but you can just have a single listener on the article node. The other benefit is that if either one of those anchor elements is added dynamically, for example, um, based on other user interactions, so the JavaScript adds that element dynamically to the page. Um, if you try to add an event listener to an element that doesn't exist, you would get an error. So by adding it to the higher, higher level element that is already on the page, it will also account for any dynamically added elements that are added later after the event listener has been added because the event will always climb up regardless of of when the element was added. So in this case, we'll take a reference to this higher element, which is an article element with the class post shorten, and then we'll add an event listener of, of the click variety. And this time in the callback method, um, if you didn't check what the element was, the, the data layer push would happen for every single element within the article element that was clicked. So for all the divs, for the header, for the spans, whatever there are embedded in that in the top level element. So in, at this point, we actually have to check um, if the clicked element actually was an anchor element. And in this case, the, the callback method automatically gets a parameter event, which is the event object, which describes the event that happened. And the event object has a parameter called target. So event.target is always available to you in a listener callback. So we're checking the tag name um, property of the element that was the target of the click. And the tag name is basically the HTML element name in capital letters. So we're checking was the event target an HTML element of type A, so an anchor element. And if it was, then do the data layer push. So this callback will be called for every single um, element within the article class that was clicked, but the um, if block makes certain that the data layer push is only called for links. So then the element text data layer variable can also be populated dynamically because the two different links might have a different text content. So we're using the text content property of the event target to automatically populate the, the textual content of the clicked element. So this is how you attach an event listener to an element higher up in the hierarchy. And let's take a look at how this works in practice. So I'll just quickly show you the, the two different ways and how they manifest in JavaScript. So let's say I wanted to uh, measure clicks on this input field here. Now we can see that the input field is embedded within the form element. And there's also other, other stuff here, such as the submit button and other things. So let's first add an event listener directly to the input field. And let's just use a click listener for, for consistency's sake. So we can see that the click input field has the ID email dash field. So this is what we would do. We would create a reference to that element. I'm 
now I already forgot what the ID was, email field. So like this, now we have a reference to the input element here. Then we do the add event listener. We listen for a click. Now, instead of creating a separate method, you can just create an um, anonymous method here. And then instead of a data layer push, let's just quickly do a console log. So input was clicked. Now let's do it like this, input was clicked. And then we need to establish that we want to use the capture phase. So put true as the last parameter. So now whenever I click the input element, you can see that the um, console log input was clicked takes place. Now clicking anywhere else won't do anything because the, the event listener was added directly to the input element. So now let's say I also want to listen to the, to the button and the link and maybe something else. So at this point, let's add uh, we will listen to all the interactions. So let's add the listener to the form element itself. So form with the ID subscribe, just to make use of event delegation. So this time let's do bar L equals document query selector form subscribe. So now we have um, stored in L, we have the form element itself, with, which also has the input field, but it also has the buttons and the links. So then we add an event listener click and then again we'll use a callback anonymous callback and this time let's do a bit dynamic thing so let's do it like this event target tag name plus uh, was clicked with event delegation so let's see what happens let's click um, within the form itself you can see that the form was clicked with event delegation. Then let's click the link. I'll just use command key down so we don't accidentally reload this page. A was clicked with event delegation. Let's click, click the submit button. Input was clicked with event delegation. So input is of course the same element as the, as the text box. So now let's click the input element, see what happens. You can see that both the, um, the listener, we added directly to the element that uh, fires the console log and then the listener we added to the form also fires the console log. So these are the two ways you can add it directly to the element or you can add it to the form element. But if you do add it to the form element, you need to make sure that um, you're only running the specific code for the actual click that you were expecting. So you would have to check was the element that was clicked was event target and input element. Let's talk about the different types of browser events we can listen to. First of all, we have the load and before unload events. So load is an event listener you can attach to an element and the um, listener goes off when that element has loaded. This is typically used for script elements because you might want to have an, you might have an asynchronous script element that you want to know when that script element has been loaded. You could also add it to images or you can add it to the entire document or the window. So the way that GTM's window loaded trigger works is it has the load listener attached to the window itself and the load listener will fire after the entire window has loaded. Before unload is interesting. It fires when the page is about to be unloaded. So you'd add it to the window and it fires when the user has clicked to close the browser or has clicked the link to navigate away from the current page or reloaded the page or something similar. So as soon as the page is about to be unloaded, this event listener fires. Then we have the form element, form listeners. So focus, blur, focus and blur listen to elements receiving a losing focus respectively. So focus means that the element becomes editable. You can type something into it, for example, that's when it receives focus and blur happens when that, when that activity is taken away. Change is fired when the element's value changes. So if you if the user types something into a form element and then blurs the element, uh, the browser checks did the value after the blur change from the value before the blur and fires the change event if this happened. And some bit is fired when the form itself is submitted. Resize and scroll can be used to check different properties of the viewport. So resize will fire when the viewport is resized, viewport meaning the browser window basically, and scroll is fired when an element is scrolled, typically used on the page itself. Key down can be used to check whether a key is pressed on the keyboard. And it's interesting because it tells you which key was pressed using a key code element. So you can do things like checking if the if the enter key was pressed or if the user wrote a sequence of keys, for example. Copy can be used to detect when text is copied to the browser clipboard. Interesting use case, especially for content marketers. And then there are the mouse, most typical mouse events. So click would be when a mouse, is, mouse button is clicked. So press down or released. Mouse down is when the mouse button is actually pressed down but not released yet. So as soon as the button is pressed down, 
uh, the mouse down event fires. Mouse enter can be used when the mouse is hovering over an element. So when the mouse literally enters an element's borders and select can be used when text is highlighted with a mouse. So in this next example, we'll build a custom event listener using GTM and we'll do this special kind of form activity tracking. So we'll detect when a specific form element receives focus, when it loses focus, uh, when the value is changed, and when the form is submitted, or if the form is abandoned. And we'll, just, we'll, we'll listen for all of these using GTM. So the next part is called building your own custom event listener, and we'll jump into the browser for this. What we'll do is we'll listen for this form that you'll probably be sick of by now, but we'll listen for interactions with the input field and whether the form was submitted or whether it was abandoned. And abandonment in this case is measured by having the user close the browser page without having submitted the form itself. So we'll be writing all of this code in GTM. And um, if you remember from the previous lesson, this, this form is pretty special in that it doesn't actually trigger a form submit event. So even because there's some propagation stopping code um, on the form itself. So there's no form submit event firing here. So the custom event listener is necessary just to listen for the form interactions themselves, but also for the for the form submit listener. We want to fix this problem with, with the form that's that's making it difficult to track it. So in GTM, we'll start with creating a new custom HTML tag. So unfortunately, custom event listeners can't be created with with custom templates yet, um, simply because templates do not support the adding of um, of um, event listeners. So we'll create our form handler trigger. We'll use the DOM ready um, to trigger this custom HTML tag because we want to wait for the form element to be uh, populated on the page. So um, we'll start with creating the outline of the custom HTML tag using this um, IIFE method or pattern. So this is, we wrap all custom code always in this kind of a self-invoked function just to protect the global namespace from being populated by your variables. And now what we want to do is we want to listen to the focus and blur and change events of this input field. We want to listen to the submit event of the form element itself. And we want to listen to the before unload event of the page. So let's see how this could be done. So let's start with the input element itself. So for the input element, we need to first, if you remember, we need to fetch the reference to the input element itself. And you can always inspect any element and try to find something identifying it about it. So email field is the ID that we'll, we'll create here. So input email field. This is the reference to the input element itself. Then we'll need to add some event listeners. So let's put event input add event listener. We want to listen to the focus event. So when the user activates the field. So let me show you. Um, so this is the focus when the when the element got the blue outline. When I click away from it, this is blur. Now I can't type anything into the field anymore. So focus and blur are the two we want to listen for. So let's put in, input callback as the name of the method and true. You need to use the capture phase or you want to use the capture phase always, but with focus and blur, it's important because they don't support event bubbling. So even though we're using uh, adding it directly to the event, so capture or bubble doesn't really play pay uh, a role. We still want to make sure that uh, we're doing this professionally. So always add the capture flag to true when using uh, focus and blur. But like I said, I think you should always just have the capture flag to set to true. We'll also add the blur um, uh, blur event input callback true. And then we'll add the change event as well. So when the value of the field changes, change, input callback, and true. Then we need to actually create the input callback method. So let's create it here, um, equals um, function. It automatically gets the event object, so we can add that there. And then because we've added it directly to the input element, we don't have to check for what the element was. So let's just do a data layer push here. So we'll do event name, um, custom form, then we'll do an uh, event type, which is the event dot type. Literally, it it has it's the it populated with the value of the um, event that happened. So if it was a focus event, event type would be focus. If it was a blur event, event type would be blur, and so on. And then we can use event target 
equals in a dot target. So just to know which which field was the target of the event. It would always be input in this case, but we want to have this. Um, um, this has to be kind of extendable, so you can use this method too to to do that pretty nicely. So now we basically have our building blocks in pay, place. We're doing the event data layer push with a custom event, um, event type, and event target as the parameters, and we're listening for the focus blur and change events. So let's see what happens when we go to preview mode on this form. So we'll go to preview, and then we'll reload the page. And now let's look at what happens in the in the um, so as you can see, first of all, the page, um, when you load the page, it's automatically focusing the input element, which is a bit annoying. And it doesn't actually fire the event listener because that's attached and done ready. So let's start from blur. We just removed focus by clicking elsewhere. So now we can see that the event name was custom form, event type was blur, and event target was the input element. And now I could use the event target to do more extensive analysis of what, what happened. When we click um, the field, we should get, uh, oops, <laughs> yeah, it's a bit fast, but when we click the field, this is number eight now, so let's choose number eight, we get the focus event. But when I click to the preview mode, it actually blurs the field, so you automatically get the blur as well. That's why it looked a bit weird. So event type is, is focus, so that's, when we have, that's how we know the user actually um, entered focus into the field. So then let's type something into the field like that. And then click away. So now let's see all the all the events. So first we have the focus event. So I click the field. Then we have the change event. So I change the value of the field. And finally we have the blur event. So I, I just uh, removed focus from the field. So change can be used. And you can you can always get use the event targets text content um, to see what the new value of the field was or the value attribute of the event target. But like if you just just to remind you, don't send any form contents to GA, for example, because the users can add PII into those fields and they can uh, really hurt your data collection when Google decides to delete all your data because of something that a user added to the field. Um, just, a, just a good reminder. So we have the input field being tracked successfully now. Let's add something else there as well. So now we want to listen to submit events of the form itself. So for that, we need a reference to the form. So form equals document query selector uh, form ID subscribe. And then down here, we'll add form add event listener submit, um, submit callback, true. And then in submit callback, function event, window dot data layer dot push, event custom form, event type, event type, event target, event target. Now, as you can see, these two methods um, are identical. So it would be quite trivial to just create a single callback for both, but you might also want to handle those two a bit differently. So you might want to add some special handling into the form uh, callback and some special into the input. And you could still combine them into a single one by using switch statements or if else clauses. But just for the sake of clarity, I've separated them into their own own um, callbacks here. Now, this, this true parameter is really important in this case because we know that the bubble has been blocked by the other JavaScript running on the site. So in this case, that using the capture phase, we should be able to avoid the, the problem with the bubbling having been stopped. So let's see what happens when I now reload the page. So let's start with typing something here. This should fire now the, the change event. Yes. And the blur event. Yes. So now that we're ready, we can now actually submit the form. So we get the thank you message, and then we get a custom form event up here, which says that uh, event type was submit, and event target was the HTML form element. So now we're tracking, um, we're tracking focus, change, blur, and submit. And the last missing piece that we want to track is before unload, which is the um, the act of, of moving away from the page without having submitted the field. So it's important that we the form has not been submitted when the user moves away from the page. That's really important in this case. So we don't actually need to create a, a, um, an element reference here because we add that before unload directly to the window. So window 
add event listener before unload, abandon callback. The, the, the capture phase isn't that important there, but it's still a good practice to do. So then here we'll do var abandon callback function window dot data layer dot push event custom form. And now because before unload is kind of useless as a as a description, we'll do event type abandonment event target. And now let's actually put the form element as the event target because that was what was abandoned. So we put the same form from up here. We push it as the target of the event. Even though the target was officially window, we want to tell the GTM that what was actually abandoned was the form. So because um, before unload is called when the page is about to be unloaded by the browser, it's a bit difficult to follow along with GTM's preview mode. So we'll just add a little side effect here um, to know that the abandoned callback has been called um, like this. So now we can use the preserve log feature of the JavaScript console to know that the abandoned callback was called, even if we were already shipped away from the page. So this is just for testing purposes. You can use preview mode with some browser extensions that let you see the previous previous pages data layer interactions as well, much better than adding a side effect like this. So let's just take a look at what happens. Um, when I try to, um, let's say I didn't write anything. Let's say, I, let's put it like this. I, I wrote something into the field. So we got our, our blur and focus events over here. Uh, here's our focus and here's our blur. And, but now I decided, hey, I don't want to. I don't want to actually. Um, I don't want to send this form. I don't want to subscribe. I'll, so I'll leave it and I'll click something like um, blog statistics here. So now you can see that the abandoned callback was called. So we know that the J layer push with the abandonment uh, message was was sent was fired. So this is how we know that the user left the form page. But there's a little problem with our current setup. So let's say I've written test at test.com here, and then I do choose to. Um, fire the form. So we can see that the submit event was fired. So I didn't actually abandon the form. So now when I click away from this page, you can see that the abandoned callback was still called. So I have to add something to prevent the abandoned callback from being fired if the form was submitted. So to do this, you actually need to take your, your submit callback. So when the form has been submitted and here, you need to tell the browser to, hey, remove the event listener for before unload, which fires the abandon callback method. So with remove event listener, you always have to tell which um, element to remove it from, what the event name is, and then you need to add the same method that is called by the event itself. So it won't work with anonymous functions. It won't work if you add the function directly into the add event listener call. You have to have a method that you can reference in the before unload, oh, sorry, in the remove event listener method. So we're telling when the submit is fired, when the form is submitted, do not listen for before unload events anymore. So let's see what happens when we, when we check this out. Oops, we're on the wrong page. Let's go back to the test page. So here we go. Let's do our first test. So just the regular before um, regular abandonment. So we're going to block statistics. Abandoned callback was called. So everything still works great. Back to the test page. We've added our um, email address. We've decided to subscribe. So we get our uh, form submit event. And now if I try to leave the page, I should no longer see an abandoned callback was called message here. And that's what happens. So the abandoned callback was removed and thus we don't send an abandonment event if the user uh, already submitted the form. So that's how these four different or these five different event handlers conspire to create a pretty useful uh, form activity uh, listener setup. So one pretty cool way to make these setups even a bit leaner, um, especially if you have the same kind of callback being called over and over again, is to use a custom JavaScript variable to actually return um, the function that you want to run. And you could even use a custom template, but I'm not going to go there right now. So the way to do this is let's go to um, let's go to variables in your 
container and create a new variable and let's call it input callback just to keep this consistent. And it's a custom JavaScript variable and this is the outline of a custom JavaScript variable as you well know. Um, so it's an anonymous function that has a return statement. And what this variable returns is the callback method itself. So this is a variable that returns a method. So this is what it looks like. There's no name, of course, because it just returns something. So we needed to return the callback, which gets the event parameter, as you remember well. So here in the callback, um, this is what happens. Event custom.form, event type. Uh, event dot type and event target, event dot target. So we're doing the exact same thing that input callback was already doing, but we're doing it within a custom JavaScript variable. And now you can use the same blueprint for all your form events um, and using the same callback to populate all the all the callback arguments in your add event listener functions. So when you want to add this to the tag itself, this is how you would do it. You would, of course, first, as a best practice, you would create a local copy of the variable, so uh, like this. And then you can delete this because it's already been defined. And now when these input elements uh, refer to input callback, they actually refer to whatever this variable returns, which is the function with the event parameter. So let's see how that works in practice. Let's go back to preview mode and then reload the page. And now we can type something here and you can see how the, um, the same items are populated from the custom JavaScript variable itself. So this is a nice way to make your setups even leaner, make your custom HTML tags more readable um, and just to have less obstructive code and just to use reusable components, which is always a good design pattern when programming. So we've almost reached the end. So let's just do a quick recap of what we've been doing here. And this example that you see here is an even more concise version of what we just did in the custom HTML tag. But I wanted to show you another way to handle this whole, whole thing. So instead of adding the event listeners directly to the elements, we are actually adding them to the form element itself. So the form handles all the input and submit events and the before unload is handled by the window again. So here we attach the focus change and blur events to the form itself and the submit event to the form itself and then the before and load to the window element. In the callback, we first check was the event type a submit? So was the form submitted? And if it was, we remove the event listener for before unload from the window itself. Um, this had to be done because otherwise the before unload would also fire when a form was successfully submitted and we want it to be an abandonment event. Uh, the next check we do is if it was a before unload event, we push a data layer event uh, with the name form event this time, event target was form and event action was abandonment. So we can hard code that stuff directly in here because we know that the form is the one that was abandoned. The return true simply means that the, um, the callback processing is stopped. So the callback no longer goes to the next lines, but we actually escape the callback because we don't want to run the next lines if the event type was before unload. And this is because the next lines actually push the regular form event. So event name is form event. Then as event target, it takes the ID of the element that was uh, the target of the action. So it would be, you know, um, email field for the input field and subscribe for the form itself. And finally, the event action is the same as event type in the previous example. So this, this is the same, same type of code. It's a bit shorter and leaner, and it does the same kind of things, but it uses event delegation this time. So as a little bit of personal homework, take a look at this solution and compare it to the um, walkthrough we did in GTM and try to understand how the event delegation pattern differs from attaching the event listener to the element itself. So this is the end of this class, so let's see what we've been covered. We've covered. Uh, we understood how event handling works in JavaScript, or hopefully we understood this. So we talked about how you add event listeners to the elements themselves or to a higher order element, um, such as the entire window or the document or to some DOM element higher up in the tree, if you want to make use of event delegation. We talked about some of the different types of browser events. There are many others as well. Um, so they're not limited to those that we listed in this in this class. And then we talked, the last part was about how to build our own event listeners to handle those really cool form abandonment and form engagement use cases that are really 
just make a lot of sense from a UX perspective to understand how people are using your forms. Um, some extra resources. First of all, there's my own article about how to create simple custom event listeners. This is an older article, but still very, very valid, valid. It covers the same things we've been talking about today. So it might be a good reference to keep uh, open your browser when working with event listeners. Then there's the MDN, um, Mozilla Developer Network's browser event reference that has basically all the supported events for the browser in different browser iterations. So there's lots of different things there, apart from clicks and, and mouse downs and so on. There's things like um, performance timing events. Uh, there's things like um, um, more specific mouse events um, and things like that. So there's lots of different things you can actually track with browser events. Not all of them are supported across all the browsers. So make sure to check the specifications whenever you want to try um, handling a new type of event. And if you didn't already realize, CSS selectors are absolutely vital here as well. So in order to pick the correct element, you need to use a good, robust CSS selector. So I want to want to point your gaze to my CSS selector guide, which is a pretty thorough um, introduction to how CSS selectors work. All right. So we spent some time working with JavaScript. You're still there. That's a good sign. Uh, we'll build, we built some custom event listeners with Google Tag Manager using the custom HTML tag. We listened to some very useful form interactions like people entering a field and leaving a field. We took a look at some mouse events as well, which will help you understand how your, how your visitors are interacting with the web page. We also took a look at the full scale of the browser APIs that are available to you if you want to keep working with custom event handlers. That's it for event tracking. So in the next lesson, we'll jump right into advanced Google Analytics. And we'll be talking a little bit, little bit about the tracker object and how that's the underlying technical landscape of the entire Google Analytics setup on the web page. So I'll see you in the next lesson.